Let's get started. Give me just a minute to make sure my recording is started. Okay, we're good. Okay, now I'm not, now I am. All right, so, um, will the clerk please take the roll? Council Member File? Here. Council Member Curtis? Present. Council Member Marshall? Present. Council Member Shrebnik? Running a little late. Mayor Baker? Here. Deputy Mayor Herbig? Here. Council Member O'Kane? Here. All right, everybody is here and accounted for, except Ms. Shrebnik that will be joining us very shortly. And uh, with that, uh, Council Member Curtis, will you please lead us in the flag salute? Let's see if we can see that flag. Mr. Rob, Curtis you hear us? has gone off camera. Sorry. <laughs> there he comes. There There's the flag. There we go. The, the flag All is right. waving in the office there. Please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag. flag. Of the United, United States, States of America, America. and, and to, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Next item on the agenda is uh, the approval of the agenda. And if there are no objections, the agenda will stand approved as written. Next item on the agenda is we have a couple of proclamations. So let me see if I can do this. Um, whereas the LB, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus Americans are deserving of the same dignity, respect, justice, and rights afforded to all citizens, a principle bolstered by the Washington State Law Against Discrimination, as amended in 2006, the 2012 ESSB 6239 legislation to legalize same-sex marriage, and the landmark 2015 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court guaranteeing marriage equality, equality in all 50 states. And whereas this year marks the 51st anniversary of the June 28th, 1969 Stonewall Uprising in New York, which is considered the most important event leading to the modern movement for LGBTQ plus civil rights. And the event's significance is further recognized by the Stonewall Inn being listed on the National Historic or the National Register for Historic Places. Whereas LGBTQ plus youth families and community members continue to experience discrimination and exclusion in our schools and communities, places of work, and in acquiring housing. And whereas the city of Kenmore recognizes the importance of its residents, students, businesses, owners, and employees, and city employees, diversity of ethical, cultural, racial, and sexual orientation, and gender identities all of which bring important richness to the city of Kenmore. And whereas the fight for equality and dignity for all individuals under the law continues, equality and opportunity and freedom from discrimination are fundamental to ensuring economic success and personal fulfillment. And whereas the city of Kenmore passed resolution number 17-292 on March 6, 2017, reaffirming Kenmore as a safe, inclusive, and welcoming city for all people. And whereas the Kenmore's, the city's resolution states, Kenmore believes in the dignity, equality, and constitutional and civil rights of all people and will not tolerate discrimination, harassment, or any behavior that creates fear isolation or intimidation. And whereas the city of Kenmore uh, City Council has issued a proclamation for Pride Week in 2018 and Pride Month in 2019, 
and including flying the pride flag at City Hall in June of 2019. And whereas the City of Kenmore encourages all residents to work together to fight bullying, harassment, and teach respect for everyone, regardless of age, ethnicity, faith, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or any difference that are perceived or real. And whereas Pride Month is a celebration of the contributions and strides made by the LGBTQ plus in individuals in our community and throughout the nation. And a recognition that LGBTQ plus rights are human rights. The city council desires to express support for this 2020 proclamation by flying the pride flag at city hall during the month, uh, during pride month. Whereas now, therefore, I, David Baker, Mayor of Kenmore, Washington, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2020 as Pride Month in the City of Kenmore. And the next one. Whereas every day over 100 Americans are killed by gun violence on the average, there are nearly 15,000 homicides every year. Whereas protecting public safety in the community is the city of Kenmore's highest responsibility. And whereas support for the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens go hand in hand with keeping guns away from people with dangerous histories. And whereas in June 2013, Adaya Pendleton, a teenager who marched in President Obama's second inaugural parade was tragically shot and killed just weeks later should now be celebrating her 23rd birthday. And we're asked to help honor Hadaya and over 100 Americans whose lives are cut short and the countless survivors who are injured by shootings every day, the National Coalition of Organizations has designated June 2nd as 2020 as the sixth National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Hadaya's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange, they chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods. And orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas anyone can join this campaign by pledging to wear orange on June 2nd to help raise awareness about gun violence. And whereas by wearing orange on June 2nd, American will raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of, of gun violence victims and survivors. Whereas we know the commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now I, David Baker, Mayor of City of Kenmore, Washington, on behalf of the City Council, declare June 2nd, 2020, to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day in the City of Kenmore. I encourage all citizens to support their local community's efforts to prevent the tragic effect of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. All right, next item on the agenda is citizen comments. And this is an opportunity for you to express your views on issues that are important to you and to the community. And you can please email your comments to the city clerk um, at uh, kchellen at kenmore.gov by five o'clock on uh, Tuesday, um, May 26th, which is now over with and we will read comments into the record and then allow you to raise your hand using the feature in Zoom and be recognized. So what I have is um, an email from Mr. Derek Wyckoff, one of our business owners here in the community. And he writes, Dear City Council of Kenmore, my name is Derek Wyckoff, address of 7811 Northeast 205th Street in Kenmore. I would like to start the ball rolling to have Kenmore gold proclaimed as the official color of Kenmore. I have spoken with a few of the local businesses that already have yellow as one of their colors and they have shown total support for this idea. 
It is in fact one of our official brand colors at our company as well. I have also spoken with various parents, teachers, and coaches from Inglemore, and they have all been in favor of this as well, since the Viking official color is gold. I have spoken with Nancy about, at the city about this initiative, and she said she would be happy to help my work on this initiative, and please advise if this is something the city council would support. And we will make it a community effort for the love of Kenmore. And thank you for your time and consideration, Derek Wyckoff. And we can bring this up at uh, citizen comments if so desired. Um, clerk, you want to call the next person, please? I will. So uh, Vicki Grayland will be our next person and I'll go ahead and unmute her. Anybody else listening to here that wants to speak, please feel free to raise your hand and I will call on you. So. Let's see. I am getting there. Unmute. There you go. You unmuted her. All right. Vicki, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can the council here, Vicki? Excellent. Okay, great. We'll start your three minutes now. Vicki, go ahead. Hi, thank you. I'm Vicki Grayland. I live in Kenmore. Uh, first of all, I'm, I hope that you and yours are all doing well. And I want to thank you for your leadership during this difficult time. Um, I just wanted to follow up on two environmental issues. Uh, one, I wanted to um, ask uh, what is happening with the uh, spraying of pesticides in the Sammamish River. I had spoken to city council in November, and uh, I just wanted to know what, what was happening with that, if there had been changes in the city policy on that. And number two, I was just so happy to see that the city council had um, hired, the city had hired an intern to work on a climate change action plan. I remember two years ago, the intern uh, who worked on the plastic bags ordinance did such a great job. And uh, so I look forward to Adam doing a good job on this. And I wondered if he would be available for a meeting with uh, People for Climate Action. We'd love to share our information with him and uh, we'd like to learn what his ideas are. Um, and of course, I would absolutely uh, enjoy uh, having anyone on the council and uh, Mr. Carlinci at that meeting as well. At this time, um, People for Climate Action does have a Zoom account, or uh, I would appreciate a city Zoom account for, to make that possible. And um, I look forward to your response. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Um, anybody we'll, else? Next, we'll take Linda Yoder. Linda Yoder, are you there? Yeah, hello. It's not Linda Yoder. I'm on my wife's computer. I'm Steve oh. Yoder. Hi, Steve. Can you hello. on the council here, Steve? I'm a uh, board of directors, president of Inglewood Shores Homeowners Associations. We're 69 single family condos and townhouses here on the north end of the lake, uh, bordered by Lake Washington and the Ninth Fairway of Inglewood Golf Club. And I attended um, um, two of the open houses for the construction project and reviewed your, the website a couple of times but uh, somehow it escaped me that uh, that there's planned to be an elimination of the right-hand turn lane into Inglewood here off of 68th South. So that on, on, on 68th Southbound, that would mean there would only be one southbound lane with one left turn up Simons Road and no right turn lane into Inglewood which would significantly impact traffic and safety issues right, right here into our communities. Um, so I'm speaking because I'd like to just voice my opposition to this. I know that the public comment period has passed. Um, I wish it wasn't so that I'd missed that. I'd, I'd reviewed the drawings and things, but I just wanted to go on record as opposing uh, the elimination of that right-hand turn lane. All right, thank you. 
Welcome. Next, next we're going to have John Hagen. John Hagen, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Second Council, you can hear John. Okay, go ahead. Your three minutes starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I'm just calling in for the same issue the previous person spoke about. <clears throat> I, I, I'm just a resident here in the Inglewood community, and uh, I, I'm the one that uh, sent an email, well, did a posting on Nextdoor, which I did forward on to all the council members uh, last, I think it was Thursday or Friday last week. I can't remember which day it was. Um, so I think all the council members hopefully have had a chance to review that. And um, I mean, I, I think my letter that I sent is pretty much self-explanatory, uh, but I'll kind of summarize what it said. Um, the, the point that I made was that um, elimination of that right turn lane is, well, that right turn lane essentially being converted into a bike lane. And I mean, it, it doesn't take a, a traffic engineering uh, background to, to understand that when you take two lanes, two dedicated lanes and combine them into one, the result's gonna be a lot of traffic congestion. And this is at an intersection that's already uh, has, has congestion issues as it stands today. And uh, <clears throat> I also uh, agree with the per previous speaker that, um, there, I don't understand why there was never a sign, a physical posting of a sign anywhere near that right turn lane that would, that would let the public know that this traffic revision is, is on its way or being proposed. Nothing was there. There was no physical sign anywhere. The, apparently the city of Kenmore was relying on its citizens to, to show up at a city council meeting much like I'm doing now uh, and, and we all know that uh, people just are busy. They have, they have, you know, at 7 p.m. on a weekday, there's stuff going on. They're, they're making dinner for their family. They're running their kids to soccer practice. I mean, I think it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's incorrect, or probably not the best way to phrase it. I think it's just wrong that the city expects its uh, citizens to show up for a meeting like this and and doesn't feel it has any obligation to physically post some kind of notice of what's about to happen, especially when we're removing a traffic lane. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, ask the city council to 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 review the comments I've made. And and uh, the other question that I rose in my letter is. What's happening on the opposite side of that 68th Street uh, where there, right now there's a, seems to be two white lanes that apparently are for trailer parking. And so, so and there's a huge shoulder over, over there. I'm talking about the stretch of roadway that abuts the rhododend, uh, rhododendron park on the east side of 68. Why didn't we do, why don't we just shift the lanes over one lane east towards rhododendron? You've got all kinds of right of way there along Rhododendron Park. Um, I, I don't know what that dedic what, what those two solid white lanes over there, uh, I believe they're being reserved for boat trailers. So if that's the case, then apparently the city of Kenmore has decided that it's more important to have a, a boat trailer parking available for three or four months out of the year, and that's only on the weekends, than it is to have a dedicated lane, traffic lane, than it is to retain a traffic lane that's used 24 seven, 365 days a year. Mr. Hagen, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're at three minutes, if you could wrap up, please. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I, so, so I think that's pretty much my, my key points. Um, and I asked the city council to reconsider this and and um, you know I, I realize we're late in the project and you know it's it's hard to make changes now but I think there's going to be a lot of uh, it's not just me and the previous speaker who are upset about this there's a lot lot more people aside from the two of us and uh, anyway I, I just think it's ridiculous what's happening when we have other alternatives we could just shift those lanes over to rhododend towards rhododendron. We can keep the bike lane and keep the same track, the same right turn through lane and left turn lane that we have today. 
and I'd like to hear from the city engineer why that's why that was not an option to choose. Thank you, Mr. Hagan. Thank you. All right, we have another person, Janet. I'm going to go ahead and unmute her. Actually, it's Steve. Uh, Janet, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm using my wife's iPad. Okay. Uh, I'm sure everybody on the council. Steve, will, you, will you please state your name? I have accidentally muted. I apologize. Janet, are you back again? Yes, I'm here. I yeah, Steve, I need your name, please. Okay. I'm Steve Ketchum, and I live in Inglewood. And I'm sure that uh, every council member got my letter that I sent uh, an email uh, outlining what I think are the problems with the elimination of the right turn lane. One thing that has not been brought forward that I'd like to bring forward is that if you eliminate the right turn lane, everybody that's going up uh, Simmons, I mean up uh, Juanita Drive, will have to be in one lane. And those who are turning right are gonna have to turn right through a bicycle lane. Now that in itself, I'm a bicyclist. I've been a bicyclist for 60 years. So I can tell you that when you mix cars and bicycles, something bad happens usually. This would require putting in a traffic signal just for bicycles, like they have downtown. There are some traffic signals for bicycles. Uh, without that, you're gonna have cars trying to turn right through a bicycle lane, and if it's a green light, the cyclists will think they've got the right of way, and it's, it's in addition, it's going to affect hundreds of families who have to go in and out of that uh, in and out of that entrance. So I think that you would only require uh, sharing that right turn lane for about a hundred yards, and I think that's something that's very doable, uh, and it would be a lot safer for cyclists and motorists. And so I, I hope you can reconsider that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ketchum. Thank you. I do not have anybody else that has raised their hand. Um, so again, anybody who'd like to speak if, and that hasn't spoken already, if you can raise your hand. I'm not seeing anybody, Mayor. All right. I will declare the uh, public comment period closed. Uh, Mr. City Manager. Could you please uh, answer Ms. Grayland's questions on the uh, weed spraying and about a meeting? Your mic. Yeah, I'll talk to Richard Sawyer, who's in charge of that, and ask him to get back with Ms. Grayland. So Great. On climate action plan. And the weed spraying also, right? Okay, wonderful. And then um, we have Mr. Yoder, Mr. Hagen, and uh, Mr. Ketchum, who were talking about that right turn. And I know that you have been talking with the city engineer. Any word on when we will have this? Well, I can pass those questions and concerns on to the city engineer. I, I spoke with him briefly about it today. Um, sounds like there are some additional questions. Uh, there might there might there might also be some misunderstandings about what's going to be going on there, including. Um, bike lane and what's happening on the other side of the street on 68th. So I can, or I can have him, I can have him reach out to these. Well, I think there's concern with the uh, 150 or so condominium motors and another 100, 150 homeowners back in there who would all be affected by that. So I know there's a lot of people very curious. All right. Um, Next item on the agenda then is the consent agenda. Mayor, if I could, were you going to just mention uh, Mr. Wyckoff's? Uh, oh, well, I already read it into the record. Yeah, okay. I just didn't know if you're going to, I think he might. I was going to bring it up during council comments. Perfect. Thank you. All right, consent agenda. And Mayor, um, Councilmember Shrebnik has her hand raised. Okay, fine. Councilmember Shrebnik. On the uh, Inglewood Shores um, and the right turn lane, I'm, <clears throat> I'm wondering if we can, you know, I think many of us are interested in, in understanding the issues there as well. I'm wondering if we can maybe get a briefing or is if right. that's possible. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I was halfway asking for, but thank you, you did it much better. Um, because there are so many people affected by that. There's uh, at least 225 people affected by that, if not more. Um, all right, uh, then consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. I'll second that. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda stands approved as written. Next item on the agenda is the business agenda. Um, the first item is to receive and file the March 2020 financial report for the city of Kenmore. Um, Ms. Gregory, our finance and administration director. Hi there, how are you all this evening? Um, I would like to review with you um, the results of city operations for the first quarter of 2020, which today, nearly the end of May, uh, seems so long ago as so much has changed since that time. But as I'm sure you remember too, March was the month in which the governor declared for us to uh, stay home and stay healthy. And on March 24th, many businesses and other entities closed their doors or significantly changed their operations. And we all scrambled to try and anticipate what the outcome would be and how we would manage over the, the rest of the year. So March was really a month of transition in, in many ways. Um, you can see in this March report uh, that the anticipated negative consequences to city revenues had not yet become apparent. Even though the biennium to date expenditures exceeded revenue by $1.3 million, this was due entirely to those planned transfers that we made from the general fund to the street fund and the strategic opportunity fund, and those totaled $2 million. So for the month of March, revenues actually outpaced expenditures by a little bit, by $16,000. Sales taxes were on track with projections. Although you need to remember that um, there's a two month lag in receiving this revenue. So the receipts that we get in March are really the result of sales that take place in January. On page four of the report, there is some new information you can see that where we were able to identify most, if not all, of the internet sales tax, which for the month of March was over $38,000 for the month. Now, if you annu annualize that, um, that could be $450,000 for a year if that was all new revenue since um, the, the um, Wafer Act took place a couple of years ago. But also everyone's purchasing behaviors were changing about the middle of the month. So we don't know if this is typical or if it was a spike. People were starting to um, accumu accumulate goods as they did. Um, so we'll have to see if that trend re continues over the next few months. Um, but other indicators of the local economy that we saw in March um, were that development revenues seemed to continue on track. Gas tax had not yet shown a, a decline. Real estate excise tax and uh, number of transactions were still normal and strong and property taxes were not yet due. What we did notice in March was the Dow Jones index falling dramatically from its all-time high in February, a decline of almost 26%, um, which thankfully has, has come back a bit, although not fully recovered. And we couldn't help but watch in dismay as the unemployment rose sharply, uh, I say to only 4.4% in March, which was the highest it had been since 2017. But um, looking back, it seems low because we know that it began to break records in April and beyond. So I'll have more uh, indicators to present in the April financial report as we get into this period of when we're really locked down and businesses are, are closed or significantly cut back and people aren't um, commuting and going into the office. Uh, what happens in April and May will be very, very telling for the rest of our, our year. We as a kind of a sneak peek into April, we've noticed that there are some declines in REIT, but not drastic. Sales taxes, which would be for February, 
um, were low, but sometimes February is being a, a shorter month and um, just, you know, people are kind of exhausted after Christmas spending. But it will actually take, you know, several months of data, really the months of April and May operations that will provide a glimpse of what the remainder of the year has in store. And as you know, in April, Rob and I worked really diligently with the operating departments to reduce discretionary and other expenditures wherever possible, taking some unprecedented and gut-wrenching reductions. And we identified over a million dollars in uh, reductions that we have built into the budget for the rest of 2020. And we hope that those um, unprecedented actions will enable us to avoid drastic actions later this year. So with that, um, I'll close. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Any questions? Don't hear or hear any. Um, all right, so the chair will entertain a motion then to uh, receive and file um, the March uh, 2020 financial report. And I'll second it. That was council member file was the first? Yes. Okay. Um, any, uh, any further questions or comments? Hearing none, the clerk, please take the roll. Council member Marshall? Yes. Council member Shrevenick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Deputy Mayor Herbig? Yes. Council member O'Kane? Yes. Council member Curtis? Yes. Council member File? Yes. Passed unanimously. All right. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is continuation of employee benefits while on Washington state paid uh, family and medical leave. Ms. Gregory. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council members again. So tonight with this action, I am asking you to consider a change to the city's employment employee benefits that relate specifically to parental leave taken by an employee after the birth or adoption of a child. In 2017, you'll remember the city adopted a paid parental leave program, which entitles a parent to six weeks of paid leave and benefits without requiring that employee to use any of their accrued leave balances. Per the policy, after that initial six weeks, an employee could request to take six more weeks by using accrued leave balances or requesting leave without pay. Now, according to the city's broader personnel policies, medical benefits continue as long as an employee is on a paid status, but they don't continue if an employee is on leave without pay. So put that little fact aside for a second. After the city adopted their parental paid parental leave policy in 2017, the state of Washington created the program called the Paid Family and Medical Leave Act. And that just became um, available and effective this year for employee, for um, well, employees across the state. This act enables an employee to apply to the Employment Security Department of the state of Washington to receive 12 to 18 weeks of partial salary. Um, however, this is, a benefit, this is salary paid by the state uh, from taxes that were collected throughout 2019. That's how the program is funded. So in effect, if the employee applied for and went to that program with the state, they would not be on a paid status with the city. The city would no longer be paying them. The state of Washington would be paying them. And again, it's um, kind of a moot point for this purpose, but uh, it, the state doesn't pay full salary. There's a um, percentage of your salary up to a cap of $1,000 a week. So under this act, medical benefits are only required to be continued if the family medical leave, the good old FMLA that we've um, known about for, for years, 
only if the family medical leave requires it. And in the case of Kenmore, we have not yet met the threshold of employing 50 or more employees, which would require us to provide benefits. So in essence, our employees are not eligible yet for FMLA benefits. But the city's approaching this threshold. Sometimes we have 50 employees or more, and sometimes we don't. Um, so it kind of depends on the season, uh, the number of seasonal workers, interns, et cetera. So we're, we're close, but we have not yet crossed that threshold as defined by the act. So it could conceivably be that depending upon when an employee requests leave for these purposes, they could be covered by FMLA or not. So assuming that all employees would use the city's six week paid parental leave benefit, the purpose of this amendment would be to provide consistency for all employees and extend employee health care benefits for an additional six weeks if they chose to then participate in the state's paid family leave act or um, use unpaid leave. And of course, if an employee uh, continued to take leave using their accrued, accrued leave balances, they would also have continued health care benefits because they would still be on a paid status. So um, you may not know it, but at this time, the city has three expectant moms due to deliver in July, August, and September. So this um, is very uh, crucial and important to make it, you know, to come to a determination at this time. So this amendment to the policy would give consistency now and in the future, regardless of when parental leave is requested or until the city uh, regularly employs 50 or more employees and FMLA becomes the rule or until there is a new law or an act or a mandate that kind of changes everything again. But my recommendation would be to extend six more weeks of paid medical benefits to those employees after the um, use of the paid parental leave program. So are there any questions about that? <coughs> Curtis, Councilmember Curtis. So at this point, if we touch the number 50 at least once, then forever after, we'd always be giving that extra benefit, even if the city goes below that. No, uh, the definition is um, to 20 weeks of 50 or more employees in a year or the preceding year. So we have not yet hit 20 weeks of having 50 or more employees. So as of right now, we would not be uh, required to provide FMLA benefits. So it's not just you hit the threshold and it's a done deal. No, it's a uh, pattern of 20 or more weeks of having 50 or more employees on the payroll in the year. So if we had 49, then this, this law you're proposing wouldn't apply? The, the law would not, uh, would not force us to comply, right. Are you, are you asking us to do it though anyway, even though we're not at 50 for 20 yes. weeks? Yes, yes, I am because Let's say right now we're not and an employee uh, asks for leave and we're not in FMLA uh, requirement. So we would not be required to provide those additional six weeks of benefits. If by November or September or later in the year, we have a history of 20 weeks of 50 or more employees in this year, an employee comes to us and says, I need to take leave for this purpose. At that time, we would be an FMLA employer required to provide FMLA benefits and required to give six weeks of benefits to that employee. So in the same year, you could theoretically be giving disparate benefits for the same purpose to different people. So I guess my concern is you're setting some arbitrary number, maybe it's 49 or maybe it's 48, and I don't see why that arbitrary number is any better than the state's number of 50. I guess my feeling, if it's a state law and it got through the legislature, it, it was vetted, it was discussed, all these what ifs, all these uh, uh, 
little teeny tricks of, it, of the thing, the confusion, the unfairness, they've been discussed and this was the best law they could come up with. So it feels like we want to set a more generous policy, but it's gonna have the same arbitrariness to it, whether we set it at 49 or 48 or whatever it is we do. Hmm. I'm not understanding the statement of setting the 48 or 49 uh, number. So I'm it just sounds like you want to give the benefit before we get to 50. Yes. So why would we want to do that? And what would be our arbitrary rule that we're going to follow consistently in the future? Well, our rule would just be that if an employee takes the full 12 weeks as they would be entitled to under FMLA, they would, we would give them the same period of benefits that they would be entitled to because at some point we will be an FMLA employer. So whether we have 45 or 40 or 35, it's irrelevant. We just want to give this benefit. We want to give the benefit to make sure that we're not giving um, different employees different benefits just based on when they request their leave. I'll let other people share. Any other questions, uh, Council Member O'King? Hey, um, Ms. Gregory, I want to thank you for bringing this um, to the to the council to discuss and consider. Um, as a person who has benefited through with full benefits through both of my um, pregnancies, this is something that I know makes a difference in the lives of our City of Kenmore employers employees as well as. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that we live in a world that doesn't offer universal benefits of this sort, of this nature. So I would say, I think it's wonderful that you've brought this up in a time when we have three employees that are about to have children who at that time most need that extra care, additional doctor's appointments, the care of their doctors, anything that may come up, that coverage, it may be not only for themselves, but for other members of their family that they depend on. And they do have the right to that full 12 weeks. So I just wanna say, I think it's important for us to look out for the health benefits of our employees. And I think in the long term, this does benefit our society and actually our city. I don't think the expenses of such a nature that it would be worth not doing. So thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I think Councilmember O'Kane just uh, said it better than I was going to say it. Uh, I think this is also just an issue of equality um, or equity with our employees. If we're creeping up on 50 right now, as we recognize that we are, one person um, applying for it now and then another person applying for it three months later and getting a totally different set of benefits. That's not fair for our employees either. Um, you know, I don't think our, our employee, I don't think our FTE is going to be dipping down to the 35 level like Councilmember Curtis was speculating. I think we'll be staying kind of where we are in the general neighborhood anyway. I think this is uh, an issue just to take care of our workers and I think that this is a way to make it fair for everybody. So I'm in support. Thank you for bringing this to us. Anyone else? Councilmember Shrebnik. Yeah, I, I agree with both Councilmember Herbig and, and Councilmember O'Kane and just want to also add that I think it's um, it's a benefit uh, that um, women will women and families will will recognize when they take employment with the city of Kenmore. And it's, you know, it helps as a retention issue as well. So I, I think I, I really appreciate you bringing this up and having that, you know, six plus six weeks um, of coverage is huge. Um, this is available demand too, right? Yeah. Yes. It's Dr. Dr. Marshall. And I'm sure I already I had it in there, but what were some approximate costs associated with supplying the benefit? I made an assumption that, um, a family of, if we were to provide six weeks of continued healthcare benefits, to a family of three, let's say they were covering a family of three, the cost of medical, dental, and vision would be about 20, based on today's rates, about $2,896. Um, 
And then there would be additional costs of retirement, workers comp and Medicare, which are benefits based on salary. So um, in the 3000 plus range. Any other questions? Councilmember Curtis. So I'm just trying to understand this. So basically we're saying there is no threshold. We just want to give this benefit and the 50 is irrelevant, 49 is irrelevant, 48 is irrelevant. We just want to give this benefit forever. If there's a cutback in the economy and we go back to 45, we don't care. We're just going to offer this benefit. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. Okay. Uh, Council Member File. Thank you for bringing this issue forward. It's a really important issue uh, for our families working for the city of Kenmore. It, like many others have already said, is it's an equity issue. And uh, those first six to 12 weeks of an infant's life are, are crucial in bonding time and ensuring that they have a healthier outcome. So is that um, outcome for the parents, uh, whether they're adopting or, or having a child. So I would much rather that the city of Kimmore choose to be an equitable quality hiring practice, um, supporting you know, the continued business. Um, let me just refuse that. I would rather that the city of Kenmore be a quality employer, giving a quality benefit to um, their employees. Um, it's unfortunate that our, we're not there yet as a nation where this is already the norm, but I much rather support uh, ensuring that we continue a quality uh, benefit that is really needed in today's society here in Kenmore and for our employees. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing uh, nobody else, uh, the, count, the, the, the chair will accept an motion to approve amendment to the personnel policies to extend employee health care benefits for six weeks subsequent to taking the city's paid parental leave for employees on leave without pay or on Washington State paid family medical leave. So moved. So moved. Second. All right, you got a motion and a second. Is there any further comments or questions? Could, could I add a comment? Yep. And I'm sorry I didn't include this in my remarks. So this is a benefit we would provide to someone who's not on the city payroll. So they're either taking leave without pay, which means we're not paying them a salary, or they're on the, pay, the state's paid family medical leave plan. And again, the city's not paying them a salary. So all we would be providing is the benefits, and the benefits are likely to be less than what we would be paying them if they were on our, on our payroll. Um, people who continue on our payroll because they're going to be saved up their vacation and they're going to use vacation for those additional six weeks to stay whole would obviously continue to have benefits. So the additional cost of the benefits to me is not even as great as the savings because these folks would not be um, taking a salary from the city. Councilmember Curtis. I'll pass. Any other questions? Seeing or hearing none, will the clerk please take the roll on the motion in front of us, which is to approve amendment to the personal policies to extend employee health care benefits for six weeks, subsequent to taking the city's paid parental leave for employees on leave without pay or on the Washington State uh, paid medical and family leave. Council Member Shrebdick? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Deputy Mayor Herbig? Yes. Councilmember O'Kane? Yes. Councilmember Curtis? Yes. Councilmember File? Yes. Councilmember Marshall? Yes. Passed unanimously. All right. Next item on the agenda is. Um, to.
Curbside lunch giveaway. Councilmember File and Councilmember Shrebnik. Yes, uh, at our last meeting, I mentioned wanting to possibly look into doing the curbside meals program that Snohomish County had done together with the census and um, United Way at Snohomish County. Uh, Deborah, Council Member Deborah Shrebnik and I met with the United Way of King County this last week and uh, the United States Census. Um, and we are very happy to share that uh, the United Way is willing to sponsor the meals for the curbside meals program. And what that would do for Kimmore is that would support small business, uh, small restauranters uh, supplying meals to uh, families who are having issues with getting a, a meal on the table. And it would partner with the census. So it's good for our business, it's good for partnering with the census and it helps entering local summer hunger. And we have found the funding. So I want to thank uh, Council Member Shrevenick for helping me along with this project. And what I hope to ask for today is the approval of some staff time to be able to help launch that project out. And what that would look like is some communications and some outreach uh, for the businesses that would participate. Uh, um, all the priority is a plug and play program. Um, Council Member Shrevenick, do you have anything more you'd like to add? I I think you you basically said it and um, yeah I mean basically what we're asking for is a little bit of staff time to help us identify which restaurants and potentially help us with outreaching to ask them if they're willing to participate and then some uh, you know advertising communications the the um, one thing that maybe wasn't clear in Snohomish County they did um, it was a countywide effort they had about fifteen restaurants across the county and they all participated in one day what we're thinking about doing um, is doing like a restaurant week where we have like a restaurant each day for five days um, mixing it up between lunch and dinner and um, yeah so I, I think council member file other you know described it very well when we're looking for your approval to uh, um, have a little bit of staff support. Is this fully funded other than staff support? It is, yeah, United Way, what, um, it was, you know, I'm used to organizations saying, well, that sounds great, but we don't have the funds, and they actually said the opposite. <laughs> they said, we not only have the funds, we can help, uh, you know, with providing personnel if we need, you know, people to man the lines that we, you know, don't have volunteers for. They already had worked on um, materials uh, that they've used um, that they can re, you know, use the same kind of materials. So they, it's fully it's fully sponsored, and they want to use their money right away. <laughs> so in fact, they have to use it before the end of June. Yes. Yeah. So so restaurants that want to participate are interested. The money would go to those restaurants, and then they'd be making meals, or they'd Correct. have meals available, or something. Right, right. So it's it's kind of like, you know, X restaurant on X day, it, maybe it's a lunch or maybe it's a dinner, you pay them the, you know, negotiated amount per meal. Um, and they provide, you know, we were thinking somewhere on the order of on a given day, 100 to 150 meals. Um, mm -hmm. And we can, you know, United Way can is definitely willing to support at that level. So Councilmember Curtis. Yes. How are the people vetted who are going to get the meals? How is that determined? There is there is no eligibility criteria. Mm -hmm. So it it is a community event. What we, you know, the tie-in to the census is that I think, uh, I can't remember if we, we briefed you all on this, but we have a historically, uh, air, historic area, excuse me, an area that historically um, has had a lower census response. So what we were thinking of is um, reaching out particularly to restaurants that are in very close proximity to that area as our first priority, um, as sort of a way to target, but it would, it would be open to the community. Would it be first come first serve? So if only 100 meals are 
are produced. Once we had 100 requests, that's the end of it. Right. 100 or 150, I, I think, right. you know, we, if we can support 150, let's do it right. Yeah. <laughs> so. And the criteria is to try to also make sure that small business or businesses are particularly struggling near a bus line uh, for the equity piece. And I would like to hopefully add of meals, I'd hope at least one of the options of the meals would be pork free to meet um, cultural um, diversity of our community needs. All right, any other questions? Does Daddy's Donuts count? We were kind of thinking a meal. <laughs> but I like your idea. <laughs> but in fact, in fact, in fact, in Snohomish and and uh, Councilmember Crowell can speak to this as well. They they did have in Snohomish County. They had some what I would characterize as add-ons. They partnered with the Hmong community for flowers. Um, I can't remember if they also had a dessert. So they, so we could, you know, we could potentially do something like that because the funds are there. So yeah. Daddy's donuts. It's got to be part of it. Yeah. <laughs> I would certainly hope. I, I like that idea. You're going through right now. Um, all right. Any other questions? Your Honor, if I could just jump in for a sec. Um, I just missed the whole conversation because a Kenmore resident just came up to my window and asked me some questions. Um, but Nancy Owsley, um, are you all good with this? Put you on the spot. Good evening, everybody. Um, yes, this sounds good to us. As you know, we have done a lot of outreach to uh, our local restaurants, getting them listed in a regional uh, restaurant map uh, for takeout and delivery, as well as the Seattle Times uh, website and, and uh, weekly magazine. So uh, we have a list of probably about 12 um, uh, you know, small businesses, you know, not, not part of larger companies, um, that are definitely convenient to transit and uh, not all serve lunch uh, and not all serve dinner. So I, I think we can come up with a, a good variety for this program. Great. Um, Great. Any, other, any other questions? Any other comments? So then. Uh, uh, the maybe. Yes. There's one thing I really hope as council members, I would really like to see each of us partner in one day of that event um, at the site, if that's even possible. But, you know, it would be a great work together uh, to help serve our city and support each other along. All right, so the uh, chair okay. then will entertain a motion to, uh, to support uh, United Way in their efforts to provide uh, curbside meals to the community for uh, five days. Is and there to vote staff time thereof, or staff time there too. Motion. motion. So Some. Motion. Second. Hold on. Hold on, I need, I, who was the first and the second? I'm sorry. Well, let's I give it to it Tina since it was her, hers and what Joe for the second. Oh, sorry, council member file for the first, okay. Sorry. All right, any further questions, comments? Clerk, please take the roll. Okay, sorry, just to finish the motion. All right, uh, Council Member Curtis? Yes. Council Member Shrebnik? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. Council Member O'Kane? Yes. Council Member File? Yes. Council Member Marshall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Herbig? Yes. Great, passed. Now, just to clarify, right, this is no cost to the city except staff time. Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Next item on the agenda. Uh, one more comment on that. What yep. uh, Council Member File mentioned was that perhaps council members could serve. Yep. So once the program's a little farther along, maybe let us know in an email what, you know, what coronavirus uh, you know restrictions there are, and how we can be involved, and uh, you know, put put a, a face to this uh, project. 
Right. Will do. All Sounds right. Good. Next item on the agenda is staff report. Mr. City Manager. All right, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, um, before I give my staff report, um, um, John Hendrickson, a Kenmore resident, stopped by my window. He said he was wanting to speak during public comment and he thought we could see his picture and he was waving and we couldn't see his picture. Um, and then he learned, um, I think from another Kenmore resident to do the blue raise your hand thing. And so if you go over there, you can see that he's now raising his hand. Um, uh, he's wondering if he can still add his public comment. I, I said I'd have to ask you, and so I'm passing that on to you. Well, traditionally, that's that's over with after the first part of the meeting. Um, do we want to suspend the rules? I would like to recommend that we suspend the rules because of this unusual Zoom meeting um, that we're living in. Something Great. went wrong. It's our, you know, let's take responsibility. And let it as long as it gets us three minutes and ends. Yep. I second that. Okay. It's I seeing a lot of nodding heads. So go ahead. Let's give him his three minutes. He he may not be home yet. <laughs> uh, oh, I thought you said his hand was raised. I okay. think it I think it was raised before he left, and I think he's still logged in. Okay. Um, but um, how about if how about if I, I get my staff that. report and then we and mayor actually just procedural. Councilmember Curtis made a motion to suspend the rules. Councilmember Shrevenick seconded it, but there was no vote. Okay, then let's go ahead and then take the roll. Okay. I saw a bunch of heads nodding. That's why. Yeah, I just don't mean it. Okay. So again, this is to suspend the rules. Councilmember Curtis. Yes. Councilmember Marshall. Yes. Mayor Baker. Yes. Councilmember Shrevenick. Yes. Councilmember File. Yes. Deputy Mayor Herbig. Yes. Councilmember O'Kane. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Are you normally, uh, uh, Clerk, are you normally monitoring the attendees looking for raised hands? I am, and I. to be fair, I did see a hand go up, but we were um, well past, past it. the comment period, correct. And there's not really a way, unfortunately, for me to communicate with that person. Yeah. Uh, so it we'll wasn't- see if he's back home and see if we can get him on. Okay. <laughs> Well, let me give a couple updates first. Is that okay? Sure, go ahead. Nancy Owsley, can you go ahead and talk about June 1st? Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I, I assume that because I got on the call uh, about nine minutes after seven that you did do the proclamation already? Yes. For uh, Pride Month? Yes. Um, and part of that is to fly the pride flag during the month of June. And yes. next Monday is June 1st. And so we would like to um, have the opportunity to uh, have the community share in uh, seeing the, the flag go up the flagpole uh, on June 1st. Uh, still working out some, some details, but obviously this would be um, mainly on a meeting platform like we're enjoying right now. So um, happy to uh, answer any questions you may have now and uh, look forward to working with, with council between now and, and the end of the week to uh, put this together. Comments, questions? Council member file. Um, I, I applaud that idea. I think it's great. It's a wonderful opportunity to include community. And um, since we kind of missed that opportunity last year, what a great way to bring it in this year. So thank you for bringing that idea forward. All right. Any other comments, questions? Um, and then if I can... Oh, I'm sorry, Rob. I was gonna let, I think John is back. So whenever we're ready to take Mr. Hendrickson's comments. How about if I just finish my staff report and then, sure. okay. I'd like to just give a little update on the pandemic. Um, so a uh, week before last, I uh, passed a directive that copied King County's for wearing face coverings. 
and uh, you ratified it on your agenda, on your consent agenda tonight. Um, we put our money where our mouth was and we actually ordered a bunch of masks to hand out to the public. And so we've been doing that on Tuesdays and Thursdays and we've, we've gotten good steady turnout. Lots of folks um, uh, in a steady flow have been coming and getting masks from us. So uh, we're gonna continue that on Tuesdays and Thursdays into the foreseeable future. Um, also, um, it's not looking like um, King County is going to make it June 1st to go into phase two. Um, all the data and things we're hearing, uh, phase two of the governor's uh, Start Washington plan is um, probably not going to happen in King County on June 1st. Uh, I'd love to be wrong, but it's not looking that way. But anyway, we're, we're gearing up for phase two. Uh, when phase two happens, we'll do some things to um, open up our services a little more. We'll bring the receptionists back to answer phones. We'll still keep City Hall closed to the public during phase two, but receptionists will be back to answer phones on a limited basis. And we'll still be encouraging employees to work from home as much as possible. Um, and then in phase three, we'll open things up a little bit more, uh, but being careful um, during all phases. Um, also, we'll probably need to extend uh, some of the proclamations that we have uh, um, passed, including the um, tenant eviction prohibitions. But uh, again, I need to know, I'd kind of like to follow the governor's lead on those things. And so I won't know for a few days how long or if we'll be extending those those uh, proclamations, plastic bag is another one, you know, allowing plastic bags in stores. Um, so I'm gonna be waiting a few days before I make a decision whether to extend and, and if so, for how long. Um, and we continue to watch the, the financials and at your June 8th meeting, we're gonna have uh, economic indicators update. Uh, Lori Anderson, our senior planner, has been uh, kind of what I call our in-house economist, and she'll have a presentation presentation for you on June 8th. Uh, just today, we got March sales tax data. So you've heard me say that sales tax collections is uh, comes in on a two-month lag. And um, uh, I don't remember the number, um, but Joanne tells me that <clears throat> it... Uh, wasn't so bad for March. Um, came in better than February, if you can believe that, but a little bit worse than March of 2019, but not a whole lot worse. And uh, it's looking like a lot of the home deliveries uh, came in strong. I think people were kind of stocking up during the month of, month of March. And also things were in the process of shutting down in March. Um, there still was a lot of activity and and movement and things going along, going on in March. So March isn't really a, you know, a, a full picture of what's happening yet. I think, I think if we want to really get a good sense of what sales tax is going to be doing, I think we need an, another two or three months of data before we really see it. So, all right. That's all I have for staff report. Let's go to Mr. Hendrickson. Great. Can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah. John. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, you know, tonight you guys passed a proclamation for Pride Month saying that you wanted to defend victims from harassment tactics of fear, isolation, and intimidation. And yet, when I look at your last meeting on May 11th, how you responded to the harassment complaint by council member Heal, I think you failed miserably on all points. When I, not only on how you responded to the report, but how your consultants, who God knows how much that cost, how it was presented to the public. When I read the report at the end, it says, we find that the mayor's comments were reasonably perceived as mean and insensitive. And why is that? And you look at some of the complaints we're saying at a swearing in, he says to a new council person, you seem 
less than thrilled, playing on fear. He says, you don't know enough to sit in that seat. I was up there for eight years. We all know how your adrenaline runs in that horrible council dais position. This Zoom thing is much better for everybody. Then he goes and he says to her at the next meeting about the Little League is how mad they are at her. And you don't know enough to vote the way you did that night. You guys spent $600,000 and you were going to spend maybe $200,000 more all trying to violate environmental protection laws, which you failed at back in 2008. Another 100,000 lost. Seems like an obscenity to me. And Dave is playing head games with a new council member. Unfortunately, she made a complaint tying it to gender and it was about politics. And then, so the report was about gender, but the attorney, when he presented it, he presented it about sex. You know, he comes up and he says, well, the issue was negative or derogatory manner. Was he treating her in a negative or derogatory manner as a result of her sex or because she's a woman? Then he mentioned sex again, um, that he did treat her, but it wasn't because of sex. It was because he treats her differently because of a, he said it was a, um, a like a unique relationship. He didn't say anything about that, that about the meanness. Really, it's kind of hate that you're bringing in there. And so you don't know what you don't know yet. You should, you should let others lead and you should follow. You know, he's seducing her to sell her political soul just like really he does for the whole council. You know, if courtesy is contagious, it is, you know, malignant narcissism contagious. You know, so calling her in the middle of the night, telling her at the council meeting to go sit in the corner, isn't that isolation? Isn't that a good example of that? The attorney presented in a totally whitewashed fashion. <laughs> And then it's just going to be posted in the with the minutes and no one's going to see it. And it's not about, you know, you need to protect people from this, these kind of tactics, whether it's sexual orientation, whether it's religion, whether it's politics, whatever it is. You all said that Dave was frustrated with her at their first retreat. But Dave was not running the retreat. You have a, we pay a facilitator. He's just another person. That shouldn't be coming out. He's the most experienced person. Mr. Henderson, we're at three minutes. Can you? Okay. So I'll follow up more with an email. Thanks for listening. I we really need to serve our community better standing up to behavior like that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hendrickson. All right. Comments, initiatives. Um, Councilmember O'King. <laughs> Excuse me, wrong pipe. Um, <clears throat> nothing today. Thank you very much. Councilmember Marshall. Um, I think we had some interest in uh, having the city engineer uh, perhaps get on at our next meeting on the agenda and to be able to present a little bit about the Inglewood. I think it's probably uh, important to have. Uh, even though I'm sure that we we disseminate the information properly, I'm sure it's, it could not hurt. Would be beneficial to have more information uh, about the plans at the intersection in question. So I uh, I move to see that happen. If uh, our other council members are interested, yeah, I think Mr. Carlin's already indicated that would happen. Okay, very good. But if you want, to, yeah, he's giving a thumbs up, so he's already agreed that's going to happen. Um, all right, uh, Councilmember Curtis. Nothing to add. Um, Councilmember Shrebnik. Uh, thank you for supporting the initiative that Councilmember File and I put forward tonight. Um, the only other comment is, um, you know, county projections on sales tax revenue are way down. So if the mental illness drug dependency 
estimate, sales tax estimates are any indication, they're, you know, it's about a 25% reduction for the year is what they're looking at. So, you know, it's fairly significant. So that's something to think about. And there, um, there, there may actually be programs that we're involved in that, that will receive cuts where you'll, you know, that'll be announced in the next couple of days. All right, Council Member File. Thank you, Mayor Baker. Um, I would like to bring back the issue of Roundup and chemicals used uh, in our community. And I'd like to propose that uh, I see that Roundup was removed, but still on the list in its chemical form and its Latin name. And I'd like to make sure that we review uh, using low phosphate um, materials for fertilization so we can uh, outwardly uh, reduce the amount of algae bloom we have experienced in our lakefront um, area. And um, there are possibilities if we look at, you know, our installations that use micro bubble um, aeration, you could have an art feature that's actually in the water and being a more natural um, a proactive agent against algae bloom via the oxygen bubble. But we, I would like to start with bringing back the discussion on chemicals used in Kimmore. Can we do that? Oh, I'm certain that we can, but just be aware the chemicals that are used for the algae treatment are approved by the Department of Ecology, and they have to approve all of them as being safe and affecting uh, the algae. But um, certainly, City Manager, are you there lurking? There he comes. Uh, Councilmember Fyle wants a review of the chemicals that we're using. Are you talking about um, aquatic weed vegetation or are you talking about landscape ma maintenance? Well, you know, landscape management and maintenance uh, finds its way into the water line, out, out into our water. And so does the free uh, fertilizer runoff that ends up in Lake Washington. Uh, we could improve outcomes in our community if we move to low phosphate materials uh, being allowed within our city limits. And uh, we could uh, remove Roundup from our chemical list of, of toxins used in our community. Right now it's on the list and it's a chemical name and it's Latin name, so it's still there. Um, and you know, Snohomish County was, has been able to go Roundup free, as has Seattle. So I don't know that uh, with you know, newer materials and options available that it's necessary to use toxic chemicals or high phosphate uh, fertilizers that impact our, our environment. So are you talking about for the average homeowner use? I, I am talking about the total of Kimmore, yes. So, Kenmore and our government, yes. Thank you. Okay, so the residents of Kenmore, in addition to the government, is that correct? Sure, yes. Okay, so we don't have any stores in Kenmore that sell that. I mean, you have to go to Bothell or, or Lake Forest Park or uh, Woodenville to Home Depot or Ace or something to buy the stuff. So, are we going to try to prohibit its import into Kenmore? I believe we can do more with uh, community outreach education uh, to reduce the use and increase education around natural or uh, less toxic um, agents in our in our um, backyards and our front yards and and in treating our our parks and uh, groundways. Yes, Mr. City Manager. Any comments before I go to Council Member Curtis? Um, I mean, you, so uh, what the city can control is what we do in our own parks. And I can see that Jennifer Gordon is uh, listening. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had many conversations with Jennifer about use of pesticides 
that the city uses on in its own parks and right of way vegetation. And I know she is very, um, she tends very strongly towards being organic and um, she hates Roundup. Um, I don't know if she uh, totally never uses it, but I know she hates it and avoids it like the plague. Um, but I don't want to speak for her because it's been a while since we haven't had a conversation about this. But um, but if you're wanting a citywide policy where all, re where all residents and property owners don't use Roundup, that's a bigger- And other chemicals, I think she was saying. What's that? I think she was also saying other chemicals like phosphate phosphate uh, compounded chemicals. Low phosphate. Okay. I mean, like our, own, our, our own stormwater policies already prohibit um, the use, uh, they prohibit things going in, you know, to our leaving city people's property. Like I can, I can put Scott's fertilizer on my lawn and I'm, I'm not allowed to let it leave my property. Um, so I, I guess that would just have to be a bigger discussion. And, and we, we have a pretty big list, big, pretty big to-do list that came out of the retreat. And we haven't been able to chip away at that because 90% of our time has been spent on this pandemic. But if you wanted to add that to the retreat list, you certainly can. And then we'll, then you can tell me where on the retreat priority list you want it to be. Any other questions? Councilman Curtis. So I, first of all, I think I'm confused because Roundup is something you spray on leaves and then it's absorbed into the uh, root to kill the plant. And I don't see how that would be used in, a, in an aquatic setting. So are we really truly talking about two separate things? Aquatic pesticides and Roundup? Yeah, I think, I think Roundup can eventually make its way. And did we lose council member file? Yes, we have. Yes. Uh -oh. uh oh. Okay. I I don't want to keep this conversation going without her. Yeah, she right. froze up a little bit and then dropped off. Yeah. Oh. So, Council Member Herbig, I saw you. So, you want to wait until she comes back on? Yeah, that's probably for the best. All right. So, until she comes back on, do we want to move on? Uh, Deputy Mayor, do you have uh, nothing to report? Anything? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> I, I have got a couple of things in that. Let me see if I can find them real quick. I've been involved to East and East to West Harvest, a uh, program that supplies food, um, donated by farmers in Eastern Washington to the people here in the Seattle King County, uh, Snohomish and Pierce County areas. Um, so far they've brought back over 200,000 pounds of food. Uh, these potatoes, apples and onions would have been plowed under, uh, but we're taking them, we're delivering them out to Frog Farm in Woodenville, where they're put into smaller quantities and distributed. Um, we have personally distributed um, onions and potatoes to uh, North Shore Senior Center on two occasions now, and um, they're very excited to get these products. I went over last Friday and, held, and uh, hauled back five tons of onions uh, that went into it, and um, it's a pretty good feeling to be able to help out. And you're helping in two different ways, right? You're giving back to the community because there's a number of homeless people and, and people uh, short supply of money that need the help. And so as a result, um, I've been able to do some good and certainly the city of Kenmore has uh, been able to do some good on this. And there's a number of people who have been very appreciative of it. I know there's been posts on the, the internet and that. Uh, and I believe I'm going to go again on Friday to try to get another five tons or so back. So anyway, uh, Councilmember File, you're back. We're continuing with comments on your thing. We stopped until you got back. Um, City Manager, you were saying. I can't remember what I was saying. 
you were talking about uh, not using uh, uh, Roundup in that, and was you were the last one talking, or was it Council Member File? It was. Uh, well, I mean, City Manager, City yeah. Manager did say it goes in the water. Yeah. So uh, Roundup does. Roundup you think it wasn't didn't go in the water. Well, Roundup can make its way into groundwater. Uh, there's been studies that show that. But we don't use it in our aquatic spray program. I don't think so. I don't, not in the, not with aquatic weeds. Okay. I, but you know, I'm not the expert. I shouldn't say. Um, but we use uh, D uh, Department of Ecology approved chemicals. But right. Which permits are gotten for before we do it? Yeah, we always get the permits. Yeah. You know. If you all want to set a higher standard in Kenmore for what we, as the city, do, uh, you're you're certain certainly able to do that. But we'd need to update what we call our IAVMP, um, invasive aquatic. I don't know something weed control something. Um, we'd have to update that program and. And all that and i think we're actually in the process of updating it this year so now this would be a good year to do that and the mpdes really controls a lot of this too yeah but the the iavmp the aquatic weeds management program it it doesn't speak to what happens up on the land it just yep. talks about what we how we treat the aquatic weeds that's why i was referring to mpdes which does um deal with what goes into the street and what goes into uh, groundwater and what you can do and can't do, like washing a car. Yep, but, and that's really easy. The law, state law is only rain. Right. So that's an easy one to remember. So if you wash your car and the water gets in, back in the street, you're in trouble. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to add, uh, hey, I think it's I think it would be a good idea for us to use the most non-invasive, non-toxic um, pesticides that we can but b i kind of thought that this was going to be folded into the um resolution idea that i brought up back at the retreat that was getting folded in with the um with the uh climate plan uh to kind of direct staff that as they're making purchasing decisions be it you know a vehicle or or pesticides that they look for the choice that is the least environmentally damaging or the least um, harmful to the environment uh, to get the job done. So I kind of, I was assuming that when we eventually got to that resolution um, that we discussed the retreat, that this would be kind of folded in with that as a way to direct staff towards finding the um, least impactful way to get the job done. Right. Councilmember Curtis. I would definitely rather have this be thought of as a policy that fits in something else that we're doing rather than a standalone, because it's gonna take a lot of work to address this, to say that there's national laws, there's state laws, and if we're gonna come up with something totally different than either of those two, it's gonna be a big deal. So I'd rather coordinate it with some work related to environment and climate that we're already doing. Council Member File, and then Council Member Marshall. Uh I agree. I like the idea of incorporating it in work that we're doing, but I also want to make sure when we're doing that, we include, uh, um, you know, organization community partners in that uh, formation of the plan so that we are being good stewards to our community. Thank you. Right, Council Member Marshall. And maybe we could uh, also fold it into the work our intern is expected to do with regard to the environment. Uh, I'd be very interested in that. And maybe that's the place it would, it would be that he would present that as opposed to um, a, a standalone presentation. Although I think that is uh, very worthwhile too. Mayor, Jennifer Gordon's been listening in as asked to speak. She's oh yeah, absolutely. I've been waiting for her name to pop up on the screen. Okay, let me go ahead and allow her to talk. All right, Jennifer, you're on. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So I just wanted to say I don't want to. I didn't want to get into a big debate or conversation, but I do think that um, there's a lot of information that I can share with you. We do already have an integrated pest um, management 
program that I've had since I started in 2008. So um, I would I would love to share that with you and um, you can read that. And I do think it's part of the climate action plan. Um, there are, so Roundup is just a product name. That's not the chemical name. So there's lots of different Roundup products out there, but glyphosate is what you're talking about. And there is a glyphosate product that is uh, allowed for use in water, which is called Rodeo. And so, I mean, I guess the one thing that I will say is that um, the biggest issue with pesticide, over pesticide use, overuse of pesticides is homeowner use. Uh, licensed pesticide applicators um, are required to follow the label instructions, apply the product for what the product was intended <coughs> at the rate that it is tended to used at, at the rate it is intended to be used at. So um, I love the idea of doing an educational outreach program for um, homeowners to be more responsible when using pesticides and fertilizers. I'm, I'm all on board and Rob already mentioned that I'm not a big fan of Roundup, but that doesn't mean that I don't use it or I don't have the crew use it, but we do use it in certain situations. So um, to me, um, you know, pesticides, chemicals are a tool in our toolbox. They're not you know, the only tool we have, but they are a tool to use in the right place, the right time. That's really all I wanted to share. Thank you, Mrs. Gordon. Um... All right, anything else to come before us? If not, oh yes, there is one other thing. Just to finish that. Go ahead, Councilmember File. Just to finish that discussion, I would like to make sure that we're, we're sharing that um, educational outreach with our surrounding business. So if there's a larger business operator that's using a, a high amount of fertilizers, high phosphate fertilizers or Roundup, we, I'd hope that we could work with them on community education as well. Thank you. Um, all right, so it was brought up by Mr. Wyckoff today. We have official flowers, we have official mascots, we have a lot of different official things. We wanted a, he wants an official color, gold. And since that's the primary color of Inglemore, is the council willing to entertain this motion or this idea and let Mrs. Owsley uh, look at it a little bit as she has indicated to Mr. Wyckoff they she, he would do. So we'll go to Councilmember Curtis, then Deputy Mayor. How many other cities have an official color? I've never heard of this before. Oh, lots. There's a bunch of them. If you go digging, there's a bunch of them that have flowers, colors, nicknames, this, that, the other thing. It's, it's quite common. Flowers and birds I'm familiar with, but yep. colors I've never heard of. Deputy Mayor. I mean, I'm not opposed to the idea, um, but I, I don't, I'm not completely comfortable just doing it at the end of a meeting on an hour's oh, notice. No, no, I'm not I, suggesting I, we do it. I'm okay. just saying, Miss Owsley, if she wanted to She'd indicated to Mr. Wyckoff that she would look into it. That's what I'm proposing. I'm not suggesting that we do it. Well, the other thing I wanted to point out is, if I remember correctly, we were going through a bit of a rebranding, or we, we had professionals working on some branding materials for us. And this would obviously be part of that. So I, I would, I mean, I, I believe it's probably tied in with other work we're already doing. Um, but I'm not opposed to the idea. Yeah, it would be tied in with it. We wouldn't waste time with just this alone. Councilmember Marshall, did you have something? Okay. Councilmember Curtis, did you? Yes. I wouldn't want to spend a lot of money redoing a whole bunch of signs and stuff we've already done just right. to make things gold. No, I don't think that was the idea, but appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Shrebnik, anything? Councilmember O'Kane, anything? No, thank you. Uh, I did have. Uh, oh, go ahead, Councilmember. I had it to, on, a, on a separate thing. I just wanted to say that I appreciated Councilmember File bringing up the issue of 
pesticide use and chemicals. It's incredibly important that we're mindful. I recognize that we, the city of Kenmore, are incredibly mindful of that. I want to thank Ms. Gordon for taking time to make comments on the use and what we're doing. And I personally would like to get a little bit more educated on the chemicals we're using. We've had a few comments since I've been on council by citizens. Um, and so I'd like to um, just make sure that I'm getting as much information as I can to help support um, whatever decisions that we're making as a council related to that. And I agree with the approach rolling it into environmental stewardship and our climate action plan. I, I, I think that that's a sensible approach, but I just want to um, synthesize my thoughts on that and um, give some appreciation that we did have some time on this important issue. So Great. thank you. Council Member Fial and Gold. Uh, I have nothing more to add. We already have a plan that's being rolled out as long as it can be worked into uh, that, that current work. Wonderful. Uh, nothing more to, for today. Um, uh, Deputy City Manager uh, Owsley, I think you might have heard that. And Mr. City Manager, I'm certain you heard that. So if there is no further business to come before us, um, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>